And the video that you're about to watch is about, it's about signs. And the artifacts, we've got a lot of them. Quite a few of them are kind of strange. Go all the way back beyond Babylon. In fact, they go all the way back to the Tower of Babel itself. These little reptilian looking idols with the elongated heads, these were discovered hundreds of them outside of right around the, the site of Eridu, where the Tower of Babel once was. Now, speaking of serpents and serpent gods, this image back here, by the way, comes right off of the walls of the actual tomb of the Pharaoh of the Exodus. That's the priest of Ra right there, throwing his staff down to become a snake. When Moses went in before Pharaoh with his staff, he threw it down before all of the door court of the priests of Pharaoh himself in his lair. And that staff turned into a serpent. Was that a message to the spirit behind all the gods of Egypt? And in fact, every one of the plagues was a symbol, a sign, a representation of one of the gods of Egypt, all of them leading to the end. And the ninth plague, nine is always a number of urgency, like one short of 10, like you're almost at the end. There were 10 plagues. Right here you have Ra, the sun god, the ninth god to be challenged, the falcon-headed sun god. That's the sun disk on top of his head, encapsulated, owned by the serpent. And then there would be three days of darkness. I said it was darkness so thick that you could feel it. Just like Jesus was in the tomb for three days. Whatever the case, on this occasion, the ninth plague, all in Egypt knew that the sun god Ra, you're seeing a priest thereof, the staff becoming a serpent. Ra must have known that his light had gone out and a more powerful god had just come in. All right. <laughs> this is Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell, and um, we're about to take a journey together into the uh, into the ancient world. Oh my goodness, this is a sharp cliff. Look at the edge of that. Now what's interesting in Egypt's journey, did you know that the Hebrews, the slaves, danced out with all of the Pharaoh's gold? But coming back to Ra, Ra was the largest god of all Egypt, well, save for Pharaoh himself, the God King of all Earth, the actual Sun God. And it's always the firstborn of Pharaoh that becomes the next Sun God, the next God King, the literal Son of God to all Egypt. And it was on the 10th plague, the last plague, where they were asked to paint the symbol of the Toph, the 22nd letter, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is its pre-Canaanite form right here behind me, coming all the way down to the last letter, the cross, meaning sign or mark having a numeric value of 400. But they were to paint the blood of the lambs, the Passover lambs on their doorposts. And they were to do this specifically on the 14th of Nisan, the first Passover, the exact day that Jesus would be crucified on the cross, nearly 14 hundred years later, be crucified on Passover, the Passover lamb, as if it were a, uh, a sign. Sign or mark, that's what the symbol 
of the Tav means. It's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav, just like the letter T, even with the same sound as the word, the word truth. The Aleph to the Tav, the first and the last. Aleph all the way down to Tav. This is the letters in their pictographic pre-Canaanite form. And here they are, the same letters in their modern form. It's almost interesting how even the signs and symbols themselves have an ancient and modern form coming together in one language. But the Tov, seen right here in its ancient pictographic form, this is the language of angels and men. These symbols is the same shape of the, the camp of Israel following the Exodus. It was in the shape of a cross. If you follow the exact instructions and numbers given to you in the book of Numbers, it was a giant moving cross with the heart of God, the fire of God, and the priests of God, the Levite priests of God, right in the heart, the center of that sign or ancient pictographic mark. Now, speaking of the, the god Ra, the sun god, and his three days of darkness, three days, the three between light and dark, three, if one were going to meet darkness on its own platform, its own level, its own playing field, and like razor precision, a sign or symbol pass right through it like a sign or mark. Well, there were three crosses when Jesus was crucified and he was in the center of two thieves. They don't even get names. Always notice the details. He was between two thieves, the one on the right and the one on the left. The one on the left mocked all the way to the end. The one on the right was mocking, but changed his heart and said, if you really be who they say you are, would you even remember me and your kingdom? And Jesus looked over at that thief, that nameless nobody thief, who can't do anything with his hands or his feet. There's nothing left he can do to save himself. And Jesus said, assuredly, today you will be with me through the door of paradise. Here speak, here is the Golgotha. Golgotha, yes. Golgotha here. Okay. Here the cross, you understand? Here can the cross. Okay, so you believe the cross was on top. You believe the cross was up here on top of Golgotha. Yes. Here all the people speak here. Here Golgotha, here, yeah. near, yeah. yeah. Okay. But there were in fact three crosses on that dark day. And Jesus would be in the tomb for three days. And in fact, on that cross, that tov, that sign or mark, there were three volves. Now the volve, seen right here in its pictographic form, the volve represents a, a nail, is what it represents. The volve is the number six. It is the number of man. Now the rabbis believe that the Vav, number six, is the only letter of the Hebrew alphabet which connects, which literally connects heaven to earth. And just so coincidentally, it is the Vav. In fact, three Vavs. Here's the ancient Tov, meaning sign or meeting the mark. And one, two, three, three vaws, three sixes, three nails, one in each hand and one in the feet. So it was indeed the vav, the number six, three of them that were connecting Jesus to that cross. 
But the truth is that it wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was his love for you and me. But whatever the case, that was on, just was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. The first Passover was on the 14th of Nisan, one 1400 years before. And there were 10 plagues, 10 plagues, a number of completion. 10 is a universal whole letter. There were also 10 commandments that were given to Moses following the Exodus. 10, the number 10 in Hebrew is the, the Yod. Coming down from our, from our Aleph, past our Bet, that's where you get the word. Alpha Bet, Aleph Bet, comes from this language behind me. Coming from our Aleph, all the way down to our 10th letter, just like there were 10 plagues, or Yod, dangling right there. Like a little thought, an idea, the Spirit of God, a little Yod, just dangling through the gateway between heaven to reach in to earth. The number 10. Well, as coincidence would have it, if I move from my pictographic form of the language, coming down to the last letter, the sign or mark, the cross, in its ancient form, and I come over to the modern form of the language here on the screen behind me. Coming all the way down, you're going to find that this last number, the number 400, and the letter above, the Tov, the sign or mark, has changed. It's now become a doorway, a gateway. To be abundantly clear what I'm telling you, this is the ancient pictographic form of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Tov, the cross right there. And this right here is the modern form of the Tov. It's become a doorway with the Spirit of God inside of it. Ancient Tov, like that, becomes in its modern form a doorway is what it becomes. So if I jump from the, the ancient world over to here, the modern Tov, within which, in the center, the heart of it, is the Yod, the symbol for God himself, coming right through that gateway right there, that doorway. And they were to paint the blood of the lambs, the tov, the sign or mark on their, on their door pass, their doorways. On the 10th plague, the yod. They were to paint the blood of the Passover lambs, the symbol, the ancient pictographic symbol, the sign of the tov in the lambs blood around their door hose. This right here is the ancient symbol of the Tov. In the center, this doorway with the Yod, the number 10, the number of completion, the symbol of God itself through that doorway. That is the modern symbol of the Tov. They were painting crosses, Tovs, on their doorways in the Lamb's blood that first Passover. And of course, it would be three days later when the Hebrews would be crossing through from death to life to the sign or mark on the other side of the Red Sea. The last plague, the Passover lambs were on the 14th of Nisan. The Red Sea parting was on Nisan 17th, three days later the same day that the Ork is recorded to have landed on the mountains of Ararat, and the same day, the 17th of Nisan, three days after his crucifixion, that Jesus would come out of the doorway of the tomb. And Jesus' story started with three sets of wise men, 
wise men. Wise men still follow him. Following a star. Boy, that's an unusual star. But rolling past our God Raw of the ninth plague, like a six, a volve, <laughs> flipped upside down, or God Raw here. As if he were a final chess piece on a checkerboard chess floor. Moving past our Sun God Ra to that tenth and final, that last plague. And it reads, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This month shall be the very first month of the year for you. Tell Israel each man must take a lamb, the Passover lamb. Take care of it until the 14th day of the month, the 14th of Nisan. Verse 6. At dusk, all the people of Israel must slaughter their Passover lambs, just as Jesus was crucified. They must take some of the blood and put it on the sides and door frames of their houses. It shall be a sign. For it is the Lord's Passover. And this final plague was the, was the firstborn sons. And Pharaoh, well, he's in the line of the, the sun gods, the great sun gods of earth. He is Pharaoh. He is God on earth. And his firstborn son will be the next God king. Literally the next son of God on earth. And there was a great cry in all the land of Egypt. And as Pharaoh came with his, his dead son in his arms, the next God King, the literal son of God to Egypt in his arms, and he said, Pharaoh, nine times God had undone this for Pharaoh. On this one, he came before Moses, said, Moses, would you, would you undo this for me? Would you go before your God and raise my son from the dead? There would be no Son of God, no dark Son of God raised that first Yod Passover. And three days later, just as the tomb would open for Jesus Christ, they would be passing through the waters of the Red Sea with all of Pharaoh's gold. But from the very beginning of the Exodus story, when Moses and Aaron had gone in before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was laughing at them, like they were a little bit of nothing. Pharaoh had asked Moses and Aaron, so what does your God intend to do? And Moses and Aaron had told him, well, our God wants us to take a three-day journey, after which there's going to be a, a very large sacrifice. And then Pharaoh, from the very start, as if toying with them, said to Moses and Aaron, Okay, speakers for the slaves, entertain me, tell me, tell me, speakers for the slaves and the God of the slaves. He literally laughed and mocked at them in the very heart of his dark lair with all of his dark priests. Exactly what does your God intend to sacrifice? And then Moses humbly looked back up at him and said to Pharaoh, he answered him honestly and said, I don't know, Pharaoh. The only thing our Lord said is that we were to take a three day, a three day journey after which there would be a very large sacrifice and that he would provide the sacrifice. And I bet Pharaoh remembered those words when he stood right there with the waters parted as if taunting Pharaoh, saying, bring your army and come on in. But coming backwards through our tov, our cross, our sign, or mark, coming backwards through our open doorway of our yod on number 10 right there, which of course changes our cross, our ancient tov, into our modern tov, our doorway, our gateway, within which we find our yod, the spirit of God himself, 
passing through that doorway, we find the name of God himself, the unspeakable name of God, yod He vov He. It begins with the Yod. In pictograph, it is the right arm, the strong right arm of the Creator. Yod, that is the head, the name of God. He, he, nail, nail. Behold, behold, he, he. Behold the hand, behold the nail. The unspeakable name of God for whom the film you're about to watch is dedicated to. In fact, if I take this name in its modern form, yod He vov He, and I turn it up to stand sideways, just like the symbol of the Vov, the symbol of the man. This word, turned upright, becomes the symbol and sign of the, the God in a Nutshell project. Welcome to the fifth installment of our Genesis study. Five, by the way, the He, like there, two He's in the symbol for the unspeakable name of God. He, 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 He. Those two He's surround the Vov, the number six, the number of man. In other words, man has to be surrounded by grace. The he is the number of grace. So in other words, these little he's, this is a he, and this is a he, he and he. Same thing as up here, the pictograph of the little man with his arms up like he's giving praise and joy to God. Those number fives is what those letters are. Those number fives, five is the number of grace. So the name of God has within it a double dose of grace surrounding the man, the number six, the Vov, which we're going to need a lot of in this video because we're going through a lot of ancient symbols, not all of them, a lot of them pagan stuff. So all glory for this video is given to yod He vov He, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But to truly understand Egypt and the gods of Egypt, our chess piece gods on their checkerboard floor in their ninth and last, they're getting close to the final hour. We are gonna be heading backwards into Babel, where the Tower of Babel rose, and over into ancient Egypt. So without further ado, let me welcome you to Signs, Symbols, and Legends. Oh my goodness, this is a sharp cliff. Look at the edge of that. We we'll walk up to that thing. So, and this is the this is the famous arch. And Arch is National Park. If you enjoy the rest of this film, Signs, by the God in a Nutshell Project, here's what the DVD for this film looks like. Over at God in a Nutshell, the film that comes directly after this, I think you're really going to like this, I think you're going to go on a, on a ride, would be the Vav. One will rise and another will fall. This is the DVD for the film Vav on the screen behind me. You can also stream all of the, all the films, all the new films immediately over on the partner section of the God in a Nutshell project. This includes, of course, Nimrod, Vov, part one and two, and our entire Genesis series that we have been going through. The partner section has is roughly the cost of a modern day movie ticket. I, I think you're about to go on some, some real adventures. If you do get entire sets of the Genesis series on DVD, it also gives you the option to enter the partner section with a free month at a discounted rate. This way you don't have to wait for the movies to arrive, but they, they do look nice on a coffee table. If you do decide to visit God in a Nutshell at any point or following this film, you will notice that in that partner's area that all of the films, most all the films, we do have some free films in there that are surprisingly, surprisingly good films. They're all good films. But the Volve 1 and 2 and their extended versions are in the partner section. All of the films in the partner section probably are going to say play preview on there. When you become a partner with God in the Nutshell, that button stating play preview will change on all of the films to play film. And I think you're going to find some 
both spiritually and intellectually satisfying rides back in there. Without further ado, let's begin the journey of signs, which would be followed by Vav Part 1 and Vav Part 2. And uh, I don't know how safe I feel standing right here, but, um, but this is, yeah, this is gorgeous. I'm Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell, and uh, let's start the video. Okay, so we're going to take a look at some ancient legends that go all the way back to ancient Samaria and what would take rise, ancient Sumer and Akkad. This down here is generally recognized as ancient Sumer, where the Tower of Babel was. And up here, this area would be Akkad. These two areas together would come later to be known as Babylon. Now, this list that I have here on the screen is a correlation of the rulers of ancient, ancient Sumerian kings as they're given to us, not just on the Sumerian kings list, but on a collection of documents like the ones we have here, including the Utu tablet there, highest and most uh, character, Utu, the sun god, the original sun god. And I'm also going to be completely correlating pretty much all of the, the, the pagan characters right off their walls, right off their rocks, right off of their legends with the, the pages of Genesis, with the actual biblical text. We're going to talk about the birth of Egypt and the birth of Babylon and how all of it, including the people, match point by point, one by one, with your biblical pages. In other words, if I haven't already upset the universities by this point, they're going to be really angry. So I guess it would be appropriate we begin with the very basics, with Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And if you recall, it was through this lineage of Ham that something happens in Genesis 9, where Noah basically says, pack your stuff, son. We're, we're going to need you to go. And Ham has this son, Canaan, who would birth the, the Canaanites. The pathway we would go if we were headed towards the Canaanite god, there's Tammuz or Dumazid or Pan, the goat down there. The direction we would go if we were looking for the child sacrifice god, Baal. So that would be coming through the lineage or the bloodlines of this line here, going from Noah, Ham, Cush, Nimrod, on through Tammuz, Marduk, Mardun, all the pantheon of gods of Babylon are going to come right through here. Now, this lineage up here, Shem is going to lead through Abraham, ultimately is going to lead through to Jesus Christ. Now, on the Sumerian kings list, which I'm holding right here, it's going to state to us as the document begins. It's going to tell us that when the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. Now, Eridu, seen on this map of the Fertile Crescent behind me, Eridu is the location of the Tower of Babel, right there, is what's being talked about on this document. It's stating, it's correlating the kingship of all earth and where the gods, these were underworld gods, making their entrance and connecting that to the location of the Tower of Babel, otherwise known as the Ziggurat of Eridu. They're naming their tower where they're going to summon the dark god <laughs> after Eden, basically, where Adam was created by God and communed with God, is what they're naming the area of their tower for. Bab El, Bab means gate, El means God. This is the gate of the summonsing of the God. Today in modern English, the word means gibberish, rambling. But our text goes on to tell us when the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. Immediately following that, it's going to tell us about eight, eight pre-flood 
kings. And the eight kings that they're talking about with long lifespans before the flood are going to line up, sort of, very close, with the ten genealogies from Adam to Noah. A genealogy that most literally means man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching, that's Enoch, the number seventh's name, his death, whose death? God's death. God's death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. Rest and comfort is Noah's name. So in terms of the pre-flood world on the pages of Genesis, there are 10 names in this genealogy, this pre-flood genealogy going from Adam down to Noah. On the Sumerian kings list, you have same pre-flood world, same list, but on this document, you have eight that lived before the flood that we're reading about, the flood of Noah, that we're reading about. Eight kings that lived right in here, right in this range, for an enormous amount of time. Just like you're reading in the pages of Genesis. And these right here are the genealogies, the ten generations from Adam to Noah as they're given to us in the book of Genesis. So that pre-flood account is going to be between, from Adam to Noah, is going to be somewhere between 1600 and 2158 pre-flood years in the, according to, in the pages of the book of Genesis. Now, sort of similarly, over here, if I move over to the Sumerian kings list, the portions of this document right here that deal with the same pre-flood, same pre-flood genealogies, kind of, I'm going to find these eight names here, eight people on this document right here. These eight names, or eight pre-flood kings are going to come to 241,200 pre-flood years. Both texts, both Genesis as well as the scribes that put this text here together, believed similarly that the people living before that flood lived enormous lifespans. More than this, on the, on the pagan documents, they're telling you that they're physically witnessing a decrease on these stones directly following that flood. That the people are living, they're still living a long time, they're recording, in both sets of documents after that flood. But that those lifespans are rapidly dropping and that this is on the pagan text, they're looking for supernatural ways to, to fix that, is what they're, they're in search of the, they're trying dearly to get back to that tree of life, no matter what. Even if this requires sacrifice, extreme sacrifice of their subjects, or experiments, or whatever with the blood of their subjects, or worse. To get that long lifespan back appears to be a pretty good sized problem that they're talking about and discussing in the ancient world. In the pages of Genesis or the Torah, demons are, well, they're the bad guys. In the pages of the, and the stones and documents of the pagan texts, like over here on this side, demons are the really, really good guys. Dark angels, demons, are to be worshipped and praised. They are the power and life givers of the kings. But as a brief example of are the long lifespans possible? They're more than possible, they're probable. And I mean the lifespans as they are in Genesis, not the lifespans as they are in the Sumerian kings list. I can't defend those, nor would I try. In fact, a lot of people believe that this kings list, this portion here, uses a sexagesimal system, which would mean that you are doing a lot of base numbers of 60. If you have a lot of sixes in it, you would be buying and selling and trading, by the way, with a lot of sixes or perhaps 660 sixes to buy and sell or do your basic math. So where you start from with your Tower of Babel and your pagan world, really does come full circle to where you end with your pagan world. The short version of that would be simply that 
how long you live is actually a function that's written right into your genetic code. And more than that, what you're physically finding on the ground, similar to what they're covering on these stones and on the pages of Genesis, is that you're finding that ancient man is bigger, badder, more well-built, just pretty much like every ancient creature that you're finding from the ancient world. You're going from your elephants today were the mammoths of the past. Everything in this place appears to be going from bigger, badder, more well-built to little bitty rinky dinky like you see on this modern human skull right here. Look at this modern skull like you and I today in comparison to this skull that I'm holding in my hand right here. This is a Neanderthal. This is an ancient human skull that I'm holding in my hand. Modern human rinky-dink skull in my hand right there. Ancient, big, bad, bold, no-nonsense human skull right there in my hand. Now let's look for a second at the teeth of our ancestors in this place. This is the ancient skull. This is the modern skull. I'm gonna turn them up sideways. Does this one look a lot thicker? Do those teeth look like they could last for hundreds of years? Now look at these rinky-dink little teeth on the modern man today. It's a big difference, isn't there? Dr. Jack Cuozzo, seen on the screen back here, certainly would agree with you if you came to that conclusion. He was one of the foremost experts, maybe the top in the world, but certainly in that class, on juvenile Neanderthals. He was their top guy, highly praised, or at least one of them. That is until he came to the conclusion that these skulls were not monkey people. They're bone for bone, a human skeleton, like you today. They're just bigger, badder, and more bold. More than that, and even worse, he came to the conclusion, he worked with juvenile Neanderthal skulls. He came to the conclusion that juvenile Neanderthals, somebody the age of 40, might appear like they were in their early 20s, or possibly even younger. That these Neanderthal skulls, the juveniles, took a long time to reach adulthood. Now, and it was also, just a, another little strange side note, was in 2017 that it was discovered that they were using penicillin, raw penicillin. What makes this just unusual, being that these were claimed for so long to have been monkey men, is that penicillin wasn't discovered or claimed to have been discovered in this modern age until 1928. Some strange monkey men. And it was those very type of conclusions that took him from being one of their foremost guys to overnight being a conspiracy theorist nut job that was dropped and ridiculed out of the science community. This happens quite a lot actually in science and I've noticed that it happens very frequently, possibly. I'm gonna be careful how I phrase this. When the opinion of a doctor disagrees with the opinions of the grant funders of the university, that could, um, that could turn out poorly. You don't want to, you don't want to rock the uh, guys in the pyramid at the top of the boat. Man could very easily go from being at the top of his game to being a whack job, nutcase, and conspiracy theorist all combined in the course of a day with the wrong conclusions, possibly. I submit to your hands. Here on the back of the screen, you have more creatures from the, the past. A lot of things that you find in the ancient past, most all of them, are bigger, badder, more well-built creatures. Even the size of them. Many of these animals couldn't even live. Creatures that we find underneath the ground and they're buried in graveyards. That's because animals herd. And they're sorted in that strata. They're sorted by ecological systems. But many of the creatures you're finding from the ancient past are just enormous. And they'll give them names like the, like the hell pig that's here. But it's just the size and scope of what the creatures were back in the past. Back in the past. 
Here behind me on the screen is a picture of Sir Richard Owen. He coined the term we use today, the word dinosaur, a science word just basically means terrible lizard. Before that, they were just simply called dragons. Sir Richard Owen is pictured here standing next to an ancient moa. It's, in short, it's just a giant ancient ostrich. Everything in the ancient world goes from bigger to smaller, which is exactly the reverse of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. In fact, Sir Richard Owen spent his life fighting the theories of Charles Darwin. Today, in this modern age, his word dinosaur is heavily used, maybe the most used is the claimed evidence for Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And if I turn over this way, you're going to see that the title of this thing, I'll call it the terror bird, is just a large, giant, ancient animal, just like your ostriches in the ancient past were literally enormous. But this here, this is what they call the terror bird. I, for one, think Dr. Jack Cuozzo's observations were probably correct. And I'm not even a doctor with an expertise in Neanderthal juveniles. So I lay in your hand. Does this skull here look bigger and badder, like Dr. Q also thought, than this skull right here. If you believe it does, then you, my friend, maybe might be a conspiracy theorist and not even have known it. But for the purpose of this moment, we'll debate long lifespans, the extent and length of them, at another time or place. What I'd like to draw your attention to are the, are the lists themselves the differences and similarities in these lists. So we start on the Genesis side with Adam, Adam, it means man. Now if I jump from here, Adam, over to the first one listed on the Sumerian king's list, after the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu, we go to, we go from Adam to Alulalum, Alulalum, Adam, Alulalum. A lot of people believe we're referencing one and the same Adam in that portion of both texts, Genesis and the Sumerian King's List. Ah, but wait, if we come down on the Sumer side, now you remember how I told you in the biblical text or the Torah, demons bad. In the Sumerian texts and their documents, like the Eridu Genesis in my hand right here, demons good, fallen angels good. I come down this list, to the third one down, and a very strange thing happens. We're at the end of each of these names, we're adding the ending name is Anuk or Anuk. Now that naming convention on this stone could pretty quickly make you think of the passage from Numbers 13 33. You've got to love the numbers on this stuff. Numbers 13, 33. There we also saw the giants, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, the sons of Anak, and we were like grasshoppers before them. Now, the word Anak or the sons of Anak is always a tie into this concept of the Nephilim or fallen angels or the events of Mount Hermon, at the base of which you have Pan's cave, where they would do human and child sacrifice in that cave. But the events of Mount Hermon from both Genesis 6 and Enoch 6, the fall of the angels. And there's always a, a tie-in between that word, Anoch, and these events of fallen angels. So is that what we have in view right here on the Sumerian King's List, beginning with the third one down on the list, when we start with in men lu anak in men gal anak There are four of these that end with the word anak coming from before the flood. Also, our names have changed. We've gone from just Adam or Alulalam to beginning with the word in. In means Lord, just like you would say in Merker is the name of Nimrod. In means Lord, dark Lord Nimrod, something more than a king. These are Lord Anaks, Lord Anakis, four of them listed right here on this 
stone. Just like we read in Yasher 12, the sections dealing with these dreams that Nimrod is having, where he says down here, he's dreaming that Abraham is coming out of the fire and is ultimately going to destroy him. And his lineage, his dark empire, will be destroyed by Abram. So what does Nimrod do? He goes before his Andaki priest. He goes before his Apkelu wise sage witch doctors. And the wise servant of the king, King Nimrod, whose name was Anaki, answered the king, saying, This is nothing but the evil of Abraham, and his seed which will spring up against my lord and my king in the latter days. That was the advice of his head witch doctor, Anaki, presumably the same Anaki for whom you're going to get this bloodline right here where we have the giants, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, the sons of Anak on this side of the flood. What was Anaki summonsing for Nimrod? We have literally one, two, three, four, four. Here they are right here. Four of the eight are listed as Anox, Lord, Dark Lord, Anox. Do we have fallen things in view that they're claiming? Fallen things that they're claiming as lords and kings before the flood in view on this text. My opinion would be, yes, we do. And right in the heart of them, we have this name here, Dumazid. Dumazid is another name for Tammuz, the character you have Nimrod, you have Indanna, and you have Tammuz. So Tammuz is listed both before and after the flood, according to their Sumerian king's list. And he's right there buried in the heart of these dark lord Anax. Isn't that interesting? Or are they just naming their weird-looking kid after a pre-flood demon. Take your pick. This is Inkadu back here, also called Dumazid or Tammuz. All names for the same character right here. Inkadu, this artifact is from Ur, Iraq. Inkadu, of course, means Inky, Inky created. Inky do. There's the Inky right there, stepping out of his portal of abyss. So, but I'm going to lay all of that humbly in your hands. On one side, demons good. On the other side, demons bad. But coming back over to our Sumerian kings list, passing the pre-flood section where we have eight kings that ruled for an enormous amount of time. It states next, Then the flood, the flood of Noah, the flood of Utnapishtim, then the flood swept over, and the kingship was in Kish, or Cush. Now, the city of Kish, or Cush, is right here. Here's the Tower of Babel. Here's the city of Kish, or Cush, which is about halfway between the Tower of Babel and where Noah's Ark landed on a map of the Fertile Crescent. And Cush, of course, is the son of Ham, the son that Noah threw out of the camp and said, get lost, son. We don't want you around anymore. Cush is the son of Ham. Well, if I'm to come back to the Sumerian kings list from the pages of Genesis, we find that after the pre-flood world, right here on their own stones, then the flood swept over, and the kingship was in Kish, or Cush. And then it says that the rulers and the kings, ruling what would become ancient Babylon from Sumer and Akkad, the origin of all occult today. Well, what it states next is after the kingship following the flood was in Kish, or Cush, Ham's favorite son, for whom he passed the garments that he stole from Noah that would end up with Nimrod. Well, it states next that the kingship in Kish is going to be began by Utu on all of these 
holy and sacred tablets here. And that Utu's son would be Meshki and Gasher, founder of the city of Kish or Kush, right there, who was of course the father of the tower builder himself, Nimrod, Odin Merker, right here. Next one down in Sumerian, if you like. But I'd like to rewind backwards from Nimrod through Kish or Kush, founder of the city of Kish, back to Noah's rebellious son, Ham. And in fact, where this particular tablet, the Shemesh or Utu tablet, the Sungor tablet actually comes from, well, if you have the Tower of Babel that Nimrod built, way down here, if I were to come up the Tigris and Euphrates, passing Cush, founded by Nimrod's father, or in Merker's father, all the way up, almost nearly back to where Noah's Ark landed, or close, coming up here, passing Babylon, we find the city of Sippor, Sippor, where this tablet was found. This image right here is identical to this image here of the sun god Utu. Now, his city or place, the Ebabar, well, his home, his temple was, Ebabar means the White House. That's where the sun god lives, the White House. In fact, uh, maybe all of your systems have roots that go back to those three suns and um, back to Babylon. I would state this though, even God himself has heavily worked over time right through the heart of Babylon and Egypt. In Egypt, the sun god is Ra, generally represented by the right eye, or the masculine, the sun god, the head chief of chiefs, the sun god. There's the right eye of Ra. The left eye, which would be Horus, the son of the royal family there. Easy way to remember this is Horus, left eye, no sun on his head, Ra, Basically the same falcon with the sun disc on its head encapsulated or owned by the snake. But hopping backwards from ancient Egypt and there's Ra again right there over to the falcon headed Ra. Notice the bird's heads. Hopping from over there to the empire just before it. You have literally six ages of empires before the death of Jesus Christ. Romans, Greeks, Persians, Babylonians. Babylon is an amalgamation of Sumer and Akkad. What it actually is is ancient Assyria. Before Babylon, you had the Egyptians where the eye of Ra would take its rise. Before then, you had the empire of Nimrod. Sumer and Akkad, otherwise known as ancient Assyria. Located on your map right here. Sumer, where the Tower of Babel was, right in this area, and Akkad, where Utu, the sun god, would found his empire after running away from Utnapishtim, Noah's name, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Utu, right here on this tablet, who founded the first White House. In fact, later, as we move on down here, he had two White Houses, two capital empires of Sumer and Akkad. Another one right down here, just a stone's throw, a stone's throw from the Tower of Babel. Down here in Larsa. Now, I'd like to take a look at our first founder of the empires of Earth, Sumer and Akkad, on his, on his tablet coming from up here 
in Akkad where Babylon would eventually rise. Utu or Shemesh seen sitting right here on his chair right here. I want you to notice of the three coming before the, the sun disc the last one or let's see youngest one who's going to get the blessing and according to the tablet and become the see three there youngest become the sun god with indicated by the sun disc on the tablet there and become the shemesh the first sun god of earth this is a close-up of the top of that tablet up there. These documents were kept in the treasuries of kings, which is where this one was found. In short, later kings of Sumer and Akkad are letting you know, they are definitely letting you know on the Sumerian kings list what lineage that they come from and that that lineage is stretching all the way back to this claimed holy set of people right here leading to the first sun god they're in the lineage of the first sun god going all the way back to utu right there that's what they're telling you we're important we get to write these laws and these rules and these festivals in this bottom section here because we come from this lineage here that's on top of, came from the other side of this water imagery here, came from the flood, most specifically the sun god Utu. But no matter the case, that's pretty much what all of these tablets, like the other, they're all talking about the global flood and who came from the other side of it. And these tablets came from right up in here, is where they came from. But rising upwards above our water imagery right here, which noticeably the water imagery on this tablet is what separates the text below, the cuneiform writing below, from the holy figures in the imagery above. Notice also the last one down here, for whatever cause, the last one, or perhaps the youngest one is wearing an identical outfit, the only one of the three, wearing an identical garment to the Utu, the sun god, the Shemesh here. I'd like to draw your attention to these three symbols at the very top, located right here on this tablet. These symbols, beginning with the crescent moon. It's the symbol of the god Suen or Sin. Now the god Suen or Sin, or more directly, the god Sin. This, by the way, is an Akkadian god, just like Utu's first Ibabar, his white house, his temple white house, was in, would be in accord. So this is the name of our first unholy trinity of gods in Akkadian. It's like the Epic of Gilgamesh is written in, it's written in Akkadian, first opening empire. Sometimes also called Nana in your ancient documents, your ancient stones. This means the, he's the moon god. He is the illuminator, perhaps where you get concepts like the Illuminati from the illuminator. It's quite literally what it means. This is the god Sin, or Sin, or Suin. He is the moon god, indicated by the crescent. So if I'm taking my Akkadian, or my cuneiform, and by the way, if you take a look at these, uh, these tablets here, take a look at that little tiny cuneiform writing that's on that tablet. Imagine how good that their eyesight had to be to actually read that writing at that at that time but the lord in zoo here notice the crescent on this side with the two little horns on this artifact here in zoo or zoo in or lord suen sin well in always means so that means lord and over here the, the zoo 
that means wisdom. You could also do this like the Zu being Abzu or Abyss. So this is the Lord of Wisdom from the Abyss, from the basket of the ancient Abzu, the wisdom of the pit is what it is. Like a serpent with knowledge coming out of the basket, the abyss. Lord of the illumination, the illuminator of the moonlight, the crescent moon. Lord of wisdom. This is all dark wisdom. In fact, demons, the word demon commonly means knowledge. They're really, really smart, but they're using that wisdom to, to trick you to deceive you, to lie, steal, cheat, kill, and destroy you. But there's no argument, they're really, really smart. The Lord of Wisdom in Zoo. He's often represented, now watch the numbers here, he's often represented by the number 30, the number 30, or three little strikes is what they would be in cuneiform. Going this modern day to also be, well, in Roman numerals, it would be the XXX, the three X's. These are all symbols that encompass the moon god Shuin or Sin up there. If you like, he is the god of riches and greed. He is the god of the blue moon light. Here I have on ancient temple imagery, you can see the crescent, that is the moon imagery for a king, a Babylonian king. Again, he's got the crescent of the god Sheen or Sin on his head and he's going to pray to the moon god Sin. So now here if I zoom in, here's my god Suin or Sin or god Sin right here. You could also interchange him, his little crescent with this horned little, little devil guy here if you wanted to, or god Sin. You can see up here these three symbols, just like the God Sin is the XXX or the number 30. They love their trinities in the ancient world. Always notice the numbers. The three symbols I have at the top, this comes off of the U2 or the Sun God tablet. It's the same three symbols that you see right here above the Sun God sitting right there on his chair. These three symbols, the moon for the god Sin, and then right next to it I have the, the symbol of the star of Ishtar, the star of Inanna, or the star of Astarte, all the same thing. The female counterpart, the star, the actress, the seductress of the mix, the royal unholy trinity here. Here is a larger version of her. She's interchangeable with Ishtar or Astarte. This is Anana. Notice that she's got the bow and arrows coming from her back. She's got six of them, by the way. Also got six little horns on top of coming out of her head. That's called a horned helmet that she's got right there. Now she's going to be the first consort of the sun god Utu. She's his first consort, often so close she'll be described as a sister. Shouldn't do those kind of things with anyone you call your sister. Ultimately she's going to end up also being the consort of Nimrod and then as kind of everybody's wife or consort. In fact, when you've got one woman that's sort of everybody's wife, there's a word used for that, but it's generally not wife. But she also is seen here in her imagery and she's subduing a lion. That symbolism is because they believed in the ancient world that the stars were a language. And that is also the consort of the god Sin. In fact, she's going to be filled with the seed of sin, as we will talk about a little later. Now, you'll also hear this term perpetual virgin in the ancient Babylonian text. This is not like you and I would think of. What this means is that whenever she loses the virginity, she regains her flower every time. A perpetual virgin means actually like everything in the cult, it means the absolute reverse of what she might mean by the word virgin. She's holding captive the lion because 
Well, everyone in the ancient world believed that these stars, that the stars above, were a language, that the history, the future, was written in advance in the stars above. Going from Virgo, the Virgin, I assure you, and now that does not qualify, or Ishtar or Astarte, for being Virgo, the Virgin, coming full circle around to Leo, the coming lion. So, in short, a good and easy way, really easy way to look at this, is they were worshipping the, the planets and the stars. So, planets were called wandering stars. They're worshipping the planets and the stars as opposed to the creator of the planets and the stars. And more specifically, in this instance, the signs of the sun, the moon, and the star. So you would have a person, a star or celebrity, behind which you had a spiritual entity represented by a planet. And you were worshipping these stars and planets and the people with the spirit of those gods behind them. So in our opening world, and Nana would be our, our star, our seductress, our celebrity star. The god Sheen or Sin with the moonlight, with the crescent. And then you have the sun god with the sun disk, Utu, right there. And Utu's sun disk, which is actually a calendar. So in the origin of our sun gods, going all the way back to the beginning, this is the first sun disk right here. It's the same disk that's on this tablet. Well, before Utu was the sun god with the sun disk, he's displayed on tablets like this one, coming down out of some set of mountains to found those first. He's the great father of all those first cities that would become Babylon. The sun disk is not just a sun disk, it's quite simply it's a calendar, just like the Aztec or Mayan calendars. It's knowledge that he came back from, from the gods that lived in the mountains. That'll become important. He's coming forth out of the mountains. And this is part of the godlike knowledge that he has, the times and seasons that you have between each cardinal point, north, east, south, and west. These represent seasons or months. You have three months, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, etc. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. In short, Utu knows that you plant in the spring and that you harvest in the fall. Utu is godlike and deserves to be fanned and waved as he sits there while all others bow and plant and reap and bring him the harvest in every possible way because he has this knowledge that he claims he got from the gods in the mountains. In short, the man had a calendar. Keeping track of the months, this is the first set of technologies. Utu's going to hold back that knowledge from the common man. That's part of what makes him the sun god. So they're worshipping Utu in Sumer as the sun god over here, nearly identical imagery. Here's the Aztec sun god or sun calendar on this side with the sun god sticking his tongue out from the middle of it. So they're holding back knowledge of the signs and seasons, almost like, exactly like a technology they're holding back to elevate themselves above the common man. They're having you worship them as little bitty stars behind which they're claiming and stating on all of their little rocks that there are powerful spiritual dark entities and beyond this they're using the language of God, the stars above to apply to their own future as opposed to God's storybook of his entire timeline, his language, his story just like the word history means his story so they were now worshiping the creation as opposed to the creator. More specifically, they were worshiping the, the planets, the planets which were called wandering stars. They're worshiping the planets, the stars, and the sun. That's the symbol for Utu, the sun god right in the center there. These were their idols behind which there were 
heavenly body size spiritual forces and they themselves the stars were the gods on earth that's directly what they're telling you at that time so in short in the ancient world the well in the babylonian the pagan ancient world they were following stars creating their own stars making themselves gods unto themselves but they were following a different set of stars. Boy, when the three sets of wise men came, actual wise men, that's an unusual star they were following. But whatever the case, speaking of Leo the Lion and constellations, Inanna being a star unto herself. Notice she's always portraying herself with wings. I believe that was probably an actual outfit that she wore. But whatever the case, Inanna, our star unto herself, always has the symbol of the star in this set of three symbols that always go back to the very beginning. You'll find these three symbols posted all over Babylon and the opening of the New World following the flood and our next symbol down our last symbol of the three is the symbol of the sun god the the utu the shemesh the originating sun god with his sun disc now, i'd like you to notice that he's wearing the this is called a crowned horned helmet that he's wearing on top of his head. Very, very similar to what we see, if you look down here, on top of Inanna's little head. She's wearing this crowned horned helmet. A little different variation thereof, but these are called crowned horned helmets that they're wearing on top of their heads. So the summary of this is that you're looking at what they're declaring is that they are literally they're greater than kings. This is a lineage of gods coming through the originating sun god. That's why you find in both Babylon, starting out there, where Utu was with Nimrod, that it's ancestor worship coming through the lineage. Same thing over in Egypt with their sun gods. It's ancestor worship. They are worshiping their ancestors all the way back to the originating sun god as literal gods on earth is what they're telling you. One stage further though, what they are stating on pretty much all of their stones, this is my hand, this is the Erdu Genesis. Erdu is where the Tower of Babel was, is that they were doing hardcore occult rituals at the heart of these births of the new sun god, at least going back to the very beginning. It's as short and simple as this. Sun God plus our star Inanna equals the God Sin. Or you can do it the other way. Sun God plus the God Sin equals the next star to be born on earth. Over here to ancient Egypt, we have the same triad system where we have Isis. Now notice on top of her head, she has the crescent moon. So these crescents like this right here that you see on top of the heads of goddesses like you might find really deep in the heart of Egyptian tombs. Well, these crescents for the crescent moon, it's the absolute same thing as the, the god Suen, the god Sin, the god Sin going all the way back to ancient Sumer and Akkad. And of course, these right here represent, represent say, it's a birth canal. That's what it represents. Who is being impregnated like a womb right here with the seed of the god, the sun god, is impregnating through the moon god, is impregnating Isis, the image of Isis. Sun god impregnating through the use of the god Sin, the goddess Isis, Inanna, Astarte, any one of those names will work if you like. Next to her is the god king Osiris is standing next to her. 
The union of the two, like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, sun god, moon god, synthesis creating the god Horus, the falcon-headed Egyptian god Horus. Now Horus over here, Horus, you could view Horus as the left eye, the moon Horus, the moon Horus, the damaged, blackened moon eye for the moon god Horus. Over here, the sun god Ra, again with the sun on his head, encapsulated, owned by the serpent. But no matter which god you are to bow to in this Babylonian or Egyptian system, it's a synthetic recreation of god systems is what it is. Because no matter whether you bow to the moon god version of Horus, or his right eye. They're both owned inside the same bird, are they not? They're both the eyes of Horus. So whether you bow to the moon god or the sun god, you're actually bowing to the same bird. Perhaps a phoenix with two heads and two wings. Those could be a blue wing and a red wing, if you like, but two heads on the same bird. The phoenix is always displayed as rising from the ashes. That's its systems. And the two heads of the bird represents that no matter which one I feed, or no matter to which of these two gods within that system that I bow, no matter which head that I feed, I'm still feeding the single stomach of this one bird. Now, above the phoenix in this imagery here, we find the corona, the crown, atop which is the pyramid with the number 33 in this particular image from behind which we have the illuminating illuminator rays of the, the sun god coming out from the all-seeing eye of the pyramid. But if we move our way backwards in time, away from the symbols and the definitions of the symbols and signs, but we go back to the origin of the symbols in Egypt's case. Looking at our sun god Ra, this is the this is quite simply the later version of the sun god with the sun disk seen right here on the Utu tablet. Our sun god Ra and our moon over here, right eye, left eye, both birds, in fact, both birds consolidated into one bird in Egypt, the god, the bird god, Horus, the child of Isis, who coordinates identically with Enanna or Semramses with the crescent on her head of ancient Sumer, a god what would become Babylon. Well, Isis's son, Horus, can be seen right here as a baby in his mother. This is Isis right here in his mother's arms. Notice the baby horse in this image looks like looks like an actual person, an actual human being. Whereas in the symbology of Horus, like right here in this in the triad of these idols and statues, I have Isis here. Again she's got the womb on her head with the sun disk. This is the god of the dead, Osiris, between them, and this is their son Horus with the falcon's head. They wanted you to notice that falcon's head in the symbology. So over here on this imagery, Isis, here's the little god Horus in Mama Isis's arms. He's just tucked right in there and he's going to become the next sun god. In fact, what impregnated Isis with the next sun god or the Horus or the Tammuz, if you like, is the, oh, she's been impregnated right here by the sun god, that's the sun disk. 
And these ladies of the night, these moon goddesses, which we find on everything from cylinder seals to statues and idols, these moon goddesses, literal mama birds with their wings from Isis over here to Indana. And again, I believe that the wings are because these were actual these were actual ritual outfits that they would wear. There's a lot of dress up in these occult rituals, probably even to this very day. But down here we see the would be the Babylonian version of this, the Ishtar. Ishtar. No, she's got the crowned helmet on her head. In this imagery, she's got the owls of the moonlight at her feet. She's even got little owl's feet. She's got the wings on her back. Up here again, this is from the Seal of Enana. This is in Akkadian right here. Now Enana is also, she's a She's a queen of heaven. And queen of heaven is a term used in the book of Jeremiah and other places in reference to a, to a demonic siren. Siren is a, a, a female dark spirit, a screech owl, a dark siren. All of these terms combine as one. Referenced in the book of Jeremiah as an evil spirit, a siren. Now, in the book of Enoch, I find it fascinating that it states that the, the women that combine themselves with the, the spirits of the angels, or these fallen angels, and created offspring, shall become as sirens. Queen of heaven is a term that Jeremiah used for a siren. Here is the Enna, or the House of Heavens, otherwise known as the House of Enana. These were major temples to this first unholy triad with Enana at the, as the moon goddess at the heart of it. Here again, she is portrayed with the wings. She has combined with the angels of heaven a store unto herself with wings, the later version, as she is right there, of Ishtar, the screech owls, the siren. She's got the owls at her feet. The queen of heaven is also Astarte, actually called the queen of heaven. Now, it's a Phoenician and Canaanite goddess. I would like you to notice that the horns on top of the head have come, become this little crescent here, just like the crescent moon on top of her head. But more than that, the Canaanite and Phoenician they would wear the they worship the horn god Baal or Baal, and the Canaanites come from this strange son that Noah Noah kicked Ham, but he put the curse on Canaan. This is the Queen of Heaven, Astarte, right here. But all of these women and the Star of Ishtar is this trinity right here that we find under all of its different names going back to the tablet of Shemesh or the tablet of Utu, both the same thing, the first sun god where we have Utu and we have these three figures, maybe three brothers coming to get the blessing. One of them will become chosen and become the Utu or the sun god. Now I want to insert here that he alleges that he's a chosen holy one and figure. He alleges that on these stones. This is about like Anana alleging that she equates with Virgo, the virgin. Everything in the occult is the upside down of whatever they tell you. So if Utu, the majestic sun god, says he's the holy chosen one, that's probably code word for he got kicked out of somewhere shamefully and humiliatingly. In fact, he's probably one and the same as the father of the Canaanites. This is a, it's a seal from a, from a land deed is what it is. That's how common that symbology that starts on this tablet here with this image here. Utu, sun, Ishtar, star, sin, crescent, moon. That's how common that symbology is. But don't make the mistake to get these dark winged moon goddess mama birds wrong. In fact, here's Isis right here in her serpent form, perhaps giving us an indication of the, the spirit behind moon goddess, winged moon goddess Isis. These winged women here would sacrifice their subjects in a heartbeat at the dark altars of their mammoth ritual temples. But if we carefully move our way backwards from the 
single stomach of our double-headed, our double-headed phoenix here, who is rising from the ashes to birth his sun god, sun disk, pyramid above his corona. Coming back from the wings of both birds, the moon and the sun god Ra. So now coming back up out of our pyramids of ancient Egypt where the eye on top would take its rise and of course the falcon-headed sun god Ra with the serpent on top of its head coming out of Egypt which by the way is always a good thing to do God calls everyone out of Egypt spiritual Egypt coming out of Egypt with our bird-headed Ra which is merely a later version of the opening sun god Utu right here atop his little box of demons is what he's sitting on and Utu had two Ibabars, two white houses. The first one up in Akkad, and the second one down here, right next to an ancient Sumer, right where the Tower of Babel would take its rise, where you have these strange Apkelu bird heads. But what's funny about the location of that second white house is that it's right here next to ancient Ur right here. Right there, just a stone's throw from where Abraham was born. And more than that, where Abraham would be passed through the fires of Babel, passed through the fires of Nimrod. Nimrod had repeatedly tried to kill Abraham, who was born right there and would rise right in the midst of Nimrod's systems, his White House, his Ibabars. But what happens next that comes right after where we left off at in the end of part four, where Abraham comes out of the fires of Nimrod. And it says in Yasher 12, and the king, that would be King Nimrod, his princes and all the inhabitants of the land of what would be Babylon, seeing that Abram was delivered from the fire, they came and they bowed down to Abraham. And Abraham said to them, For do not bow down to me, but bow down to the Lord God who has made you, and serve him and go in his ways, for it is he who delivered me out of this fire. And it is he, the Lord God of the heavens, who created the souls and spirits of all men. Now watch this. This is probably the one wise thing that Nimrod ever did in his entire life. Notice the wolf came up behind me when I said that. And Nimrod gave Abraham many presents, and he gave him two head servants from the king's house. The name of one was Oni, and the name of the other Elizier. And all of the kings and princes and servants gave Abram many gifts of silver and gold and pearl. Leaving Babylon is always profitable in both a spiritual and a physical sense. And Abraham went forth from the king in peace, and many of the king, that's Nimrod's servants, followed him. And about 300 joined him just like Gideon's 300. Now when we read in Genesis that Abram went and saved, he basically saved Lot twice, but as if Abram had a standing army of his own. What well, we're learning here in Yasher what that standing army was. That standing army was not just some of Nimrod's men, that was Nimrod's top men who chose Abram over dusty Nimrod and his crumbling towers and systems. There was prosper in that path from the hands of the enemy. And by the way, all the cult today comes from both Babylon and over here in Egypt, the two places that blessed Abraham. Whether they knew it or not, they blessed the hands of Abraham. And God said, I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. In short, 
you never would have ever even heard of Egypt or Babylon, either one of them, had it not been for righteous men and the blessing of God even on these wicked places. So let's look again at these bird heads, their systems. The number nine for the ninth plague, the sun gods and their all-seeing eye. And since these things are still here in different systems, manifestations, and forms, going all the way back to the very first empire in the earth, Let's head backwards through the eye atop the pyramids of Egypt and our sun god Ra with the snake on his head, the origin of these things. Hopping back over to where the Tower of Babel would take its rise and these Epkelu bird head sage witch doctor forms under both Utu and Nimrod, Gilgamesh and Tammuz. And then coming right back, right up here to our places of origin and our chimera bird heads like chess pieces on a spiritual chessboard. Rewinding all the way backwards to our first sun god of all earth. Utu, the Shemesh, right there. And his Apkelu conjures, demon witch doctor conjures. That's precisely what they're described as, and that's exactly what they are, according to, according certainly to the Sumerian and Akkadian texts. The Apkelu sages seen right here with the bird outfits. By the way, I've got the crow or the raven. The, these bird forms actually come from, this was, so in your Bible, in your Bible, it's the, the dove that came in with an olive branch to Noah. Came back, he was a useful bird that came back with hope. That's what the olive branch was. The crow or the raven or the falcon was the worthless bird that Noah had released. That's what the Babylonians, going all the way back to the beginning, were actually worshipping. They, the worthless bird that went to and fro, just like in the book of Job. Satan was going to and fro in the earth when he spotted Job to come and test Job. The worthless bird is what's being represented. But these bird heads, these Epkelu, demon sage, chimera, bird headed chimera forms, well, these were said to be jinn. That's what they are. In fact, that's the origin of genies or jinn. And originally, jinn, and even in Islam, in any originating all face coming back from ancient Babylon, Jinns are simply demons, which is why in the Babylonian text is telling you that they were conjurers, but they're also chimera creatures. They're representing to you as their jinn, their conjurers, their demon, wise men, sage conjurers are dressing as, well, they're dressing as in the image of things from the pre-flood world is what they're copying. And not only are they copying that, but they would brand that all over the earth, even into the Americas. This is right out front, the Mesa Verdes, which those Mesa Verde cliff dwellings are over here. We have Indian cliff dwellings. But this here, and they make this out of metal. But you can see these bird outfits that the Indians used to make. And they would do these dances around. These find their origin in the Epkelu sages of ancient Sumer. It's a fancy word for these were the witch doctors surrounding. So here's the sun god and he's surrounded, his inner core, his inner dark lair is surrounded by a set of sages in ancient Sumer, coincidentally seven of them. And they, they wore outfits. So you have one that looks like a fish. It's got a large fish head on it. One that's got a, a giant bird head on it. It's also got wings, like angels have wings. These are chimera 
They're copying stuff from the pre-flood world is what they're doing. They're trying to recreate that world with their sages, their witch doctors, and one that looks like a man. The pine cones they're holding are commonly thought to represent the pineal gland. But whatever the case, the Apkelu sage, the more infamous ones, one copied all over the face of the earth, is the bird-headed Apkelu sage wise man witch doctor of ancient Sumer. Now this right here is one is an it's identical to the Apkelu sages of ancient Sumer. Only this one was found by a father Chris Bay, Chris Bay, in South America. And you can see that it's got the standard what we about the Philistine headwear. It's of course got the the bird head for the Apkelu witch doctor sages it's got the the wings on its back the heavenly wings and of course the the pine cone represent, representing the pineal gland which it's holding in its hand so and this artifact was found allegedly found in, in south america here we have the chinese li gong bird-headed man here is the bird man god wise man sage Garud. This right here, this is quite literally another version of the of the bird god Garud from India. So you have stretching into India, you have stretching into China, you have stretching down into the Americas. This is the, the bird-headed god Garud. He is the companion in Hinduism, traffics with Vishnu. Seen back here, Vishnu has many avatars, many faces. Vishnu is commonly a, a bluish color or a purplish like seen here. Vishnu sleeps in the heavenly nirvana on his, on his bed of, of serpents. And his companion is the Garud. Some of the largest statues in the world, idols in the world, are made to Shiva who lives up in the holy mountains of Kailash. And of course the Garud and Vishnu. There's a very common one. You can see the, the bird head, just like the Apkello. And these are all from Native Americans in the Americas. That's what these little Kachina dolls are. And by the way, there's nothing actually wrong with the raven or the crow or the, in Ra's case, the, the falcon. They're, they're just birds any more than there's anything wrong actually with a snake. A snake just does what it does, lies in wait and it strikes. But we're looking at these as, these as symbols and the symbol of the falcon, the crow, the raven or the serpent are always affiliated with the occult just like all of the gods of Egypt and all the gods of Babylon would be the source of your occult today. In fact, the choosing of the falcon, the raven, the crow, comes, in my view, at least in part, from what you see with the blessings and the cursings of the, the three sons. This division, both spiritually and physically, of the, of the three sons, where Ham will as the lineage of Canaan leading through Nimrod, Ham, and this lineage up here going through Shem to Abraham all the way through through Israel. These two paths split ways in both a physical and a spiritual sense, specifically in, in Genesis 9, just like the ninth plague was the sun god Ra, who is the falcon or the ravens, head, the worthless bird that went to and fro. Maybe like a dark bird spirit with the covering of the serpent just flying above man and claiming that it's good. Notice I use the word claiming good on this number nine. Now if you flip the number nine upside down, it actually would be a, a six or the number of man. The Number nine, claiming it's the sun god there. Whereas the other lineage, the bird that Noah favored, Genesis 8, the number of new beginnings, he released a dove that came back with the olive branch. Similarly, you have the spirit of God resting upon Jesus at the 
baptism of the River Jordan came and rested on him like a dove. And in Matthew 10, 16, we read, and sending out the 12, just like there are 12 months in the year, 12 tribes to Israel, 12 disciples of Jesus. In sending out the 12, Jesus said unto them, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Pharaoh's entire dark circle is often compared to a den of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless. And we've got our word again, doves. Now, wise as serpents is actually kind of interesting because serpents aren't notoriously, uh, they're not known for being particularly wise. They sort of just lay in wait for a prey to come through and they strike. That's about all they do. So the wise attached to serpents has a some kind of a demonic. The serpent is always attached to the nakosh that we read about in the Garden of Eden. This bright, shining, serpentine angel, wise as serpents. Even the American Indians, stretching all the way to the Americas, have taken this kind of symbolism on their chief headdress, their war headdress, or their spiritual ritual headdress, each individual feather could have its own meaning. But looking at our sun god Ra, who is merely the next, an ancient Assyria, Sumer and Akkad, you had Utu or the Shemesh, the sun god, literally the next empire would have your sun god as Ra being the one challenged in the ninth plague, just as in Genesis 9 we have the spiritual splitting up, spiritual and physical splitting up of the three sons in Genesis 9. Well, the number 9 in Hebrew, and again I'm using the ancient Hebrew, the pre-Canaanite Hebrew, or also called pictographic Hebrew, the number 9 would be this circle here with the X on it, the letter Tet. So here on the screen I have the Tet right here with the X right through it in its ancient pictographic form could be like an X marks the spot or a mystery box that you could reach inside of. Now if I come over to the modern form of the language, I come down from the first letter, the Aleph right there, all the way down to the ninth one. That's the Tet right there. Notice the form of the letter has changed. It now looks sort of like a, well, it looks like a, a basket. In fact, that's exactly what it's said to be, the number nine, just like there's nine months in a pregnancy. And by the way, if we're birthing something, well, inside that basket, well, there could be something really good in there or there could be something evil in there under our nines. They could be a number nine, or you could just as easily flip them upside down and they would be sixes. But I'd like to take your attention from the tet as its basket form back over to our, our ancient tet with the X in the circle, the mystery box. Here is our ancient form of the, the language. It's pictographic form. We start with the, the Aleph down here, the number one, the letter that starts everything. I want you to notice that the Aleph is the bull with the horns in its ancient pictographic form. That symbol represents, it's the, sometimes it's the silent letter. Yet it's the silent letter that starts everything. Horns are a symbol of authority. That's why the devil is always trying to copy that. Saying, look at me, look at me, I've got the horns, I've got the horns. The Aleph, or the number one, the silent letter, that starts everything, is drawn like this, pictographically, or over here I have my modern form of the Aleph. The Aleph in its modern form is comprised of two Yodes. Now if you remember, each Yod is a number 10, symbol of God Himself, for God Himself, like a thought dangling between 
heaven and earth. Between the two yods is the symbol of the vav, the number six, the symbol of a man, meaning man is surrounded by God as that first letter, the bull with the horns. Aleph is the father of the alphabet. In fact, the Aleph and the Bet are the first two letters of the Hebrew language. It's where we get the word Alpha Bet, the Aleph and the Bet. But taking our Aleph and coming inward from the number one all the way down to the mystery box, the circle with the X, the letter of the Tet. Well, I take my ancient tet right there and I move over to my modern tet, which could symbolize a basket, could be something good in there, could be something evil inside of there. Tet is the least used letter of the entire Hebrew alphabet. But the tet is a very special letter. There are only seven, or in some Hebrew Torahs, eight, what are called tagan, or crowned letters. The tet, the number nine, happens to be one of those crowned tagan letters, meaning that it actually has three forms. It has the ancient form, it has the modern form, and then its last form, or its tag and crowned form is something a little like this right here. So does its crowned form right there, the number nine, the tet, or crowned covering cherub nakosh form? Does that look a little like a, does it look like a serpent to you? So our basket that might have something good or evil has now become a crowned snake. And that third form of the, of the tag, the number nine right there, the tag and crowned form of it, like a, uh, maybe like a chess piece on a spiritual chess board. What I know is this, the first place we find our serpent, or Nikosh, is in Genesis 3. In fact, it's right here under the, the fall of man. It's where we first find our serpent. It's called the law of first mention. Now, if you recall from our garments, from the Garden of God, our Nikosh in the Garden, Genesis 3, actually verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit from the tree was good for food, that's one, and was pleasing to the eyes, it was desirable to the eyes, and also desirable to make one wise, that's three things. She took some and she ate of it, and she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate also. Then the eyes, what happened here in this passage? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. But yet this word that we read right here, naked, it actually is a little bit of a, a play on words. The word naked there is actually the word arom. So it became a room at the moment where these eyes had opened. So if I go back just a little bit in Genesis 3, it reads this, 3.1. Now the serpent, that's Nikosh, the Nikosh serpent, was more crafty, more clever than any of the other animals that God had made. What was this thing in the garden? When I drop down to verse 7, that's a number of completion, the Zion, the number, a number of completion, just like there are seven days in your week, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. But the word naked, like a loss of innocence when the eyes, the ayan, the ayan perhaps raw, 
was opened. They had lost their innocence. They were no longer like God. Well, what has actually happened? Now, the serpent was more crafty, more clever, but the word there actually is arom. It's a play on words. Because as we come down to our 3-7, our number of completion, what had been completed, the eyes, the iron raw of both of them had been opened. And they realized they were naked. But uh uh-oh, the word naked there is also arom. In short, they had just taken on a property of the serpent. They were less like God and more like the snake is what that passage is telling you. Now the next passage reads, still in Genesis 3, And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This is generally thought to be the the first sacrifice. So something was going to have to pay the price. Something was going to have to give up its skins for the covering of sins. Now, a, a, a covering in this passage reminds me of when Ezekiel wrote to the king of Tyre, only he's writing to someone larger, someone far larger behind, the spirit behind the king of Tyre, because he states this, he says, you were in Eden, in the garden of God. Well, the king of Tyre wasn't in the garden of God. There were only three parties in there, Adam, Eve and the Nakash. Every precious stone adorns you. There are nine of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh uh-oh, nine. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as, as what? As a a guardian cherub, a covering cherub. For so I had ordained you. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until I cast you out of the heavens, O guardian cherub. For wickedness was found within you. Now if I come back to Genesis 3 where the eyes had been opened and the Lord God said the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil the iron raw had been opened. He was no longer innocent And for this cause, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and be bound now to death forever. Now, what were they bound to? What had they fallen from when they had become arom, crafty, deceptive, taken on a property of the serpent? Well, I know this, that the word light begins with the aleph. It begins with God himself moving through the symbol of the Vav, the number six, right there, leading into the head of the man, or the Resh. That is the three-letter Hebrew word for light. Well, if I change light to the word skins, it only changes one letter. Can you guess what letter that is? It changes the Aleph, or God himself, into the iron or the iron raw. So either light or evil, darkness, can now pass through the valve, the number six, and enter the mind of man with the changing of the aleph to the iron, light into skins. Now, more than this, when we change light into skins with the use of our nikosh and our iron raw, so light or dark can pass through the vulv, the man, into the resh. Well, the ancient resh represents godhead, godman, man that God is using, just like Adam. 
was someone that communed with God. Yet something had changed because the ancient resh, which means head man or God man, a righteousness is implied, has turned into a modern resh where it's now missing the face. It's now a mindless resh. So the light of God or the light of the iron raw, nakosh or evil, can flow through the vov, the man, who is now a faceless, mindless man, is the new symbolism. But yet these, these garments of skin were given to Adam and Eve as a covering. And the serpent, the nakosh, was cursed in that passage to crawl on its belly, or in other words, you will be put low. In the belly of what, I wonder? I wonder what it was that was a covering cherub. I wonder what it was that might have lost its covering skins that day that were handed to Adam and Eve. Here's your new covering of skins. But nonetheless, we read that those coverings, as well as a vast array of personal effects from Adam, made it all the way down through the pre-flood generations, all the way to the hands of Noah, meaning rest or comfort, and would be taken on to that boat by Noah, many artifacts of Adam, no matter what those garments were. It would have been an interesting artifact to have. And they were entrusted through all those generations to Noah. And following the flood, when we have Noah and his three sons, we read this in Genesis 9. Notice I've taken the liberty to put a crowned tet, a crowned nine at the top. Now Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. There's always something about the bread and the wine. Even Jesus and Melchizedek, they would always break out the bread and the wine. But this is the first thing that Noah thinks to do, is he plants a vineyard. But when he drank some of its wine, he became drunken and he was uncovered inside of his tent. Now in verse 22, Genesis 9, 22, just like there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, it was Ham, the father of Canaan, that saw his father naked, I was going to say this three times, and told his two brothers outside, what was Ham doing, whittling up in there? There's always something about the origin of Babel, Babylon, Sumer and Accord that has something to do with perversions. But he told his brothers outside, but Shem and Japheth, to cover their father's shame, his nakedness. They took a garment. What special garment was this that Noah had that they came in to cover him with? And they walked in backwards to cover their father's nakedness. And their faces were turned away so that they would not see their father naked. That's three times. But Ham wanted to wiggle in there. Why? Or perhaps also, and equally, what did he long so badly in his heart to go in and to steal? What we know is this. Still in Genesis 9. Notice I've got the ancient tet, the circle with the X, and the crowned Tet, so it looks like a Nikosh. Still in Genesis 9, blessings and cursings of the three sons. Verse, passage 24, that's a number of authority before God. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. But he also said, Praise be the Lord, the God of Shem. And by the way, this is a spiritual thing. All of these lineages of boys would do, would do horrible things, many of them, some of them very righteous things, but horrible things over time. But in this instance, this spiritual instance, the curse would go to this lineage here, specifically not on him, luckily for that, but directly down on his son Canaan. Conversely, you would have a high blessing that would come up on this lineage, Shem. Now let me ask you this, because here's their symbols before you. So right here I have the symbol of the, the first 
sun god of all earth, Uchu, or the Shemesh, right there, his symbol. Portraying that he has been blessed, he is one of the three. One, two, three. I believe the youngest from this image, wearing the same garment as the Utu here. Does his sun disc, his calendar right here, look an awful lot like the ancient Tet? Just lay it in your hands. And here's the modern Tet, the crowned Tet. But if we look at Shem, we have the symbol of the Shen. It's the letter right before, right before, it's the number 300 is what it is. It's the letter and number right before the cross, the toll of the sign or mark. It is a letter or a symbol of high blessing, high authority. The number nine is a, it's a number of, of urgency, possible danger, like 911. The symbol of the Shen, that is the unspeakable name, the hidden name of God, is the symbol of Hashem. It is the consuming fire, the teeth, or it could look like a crown of a king, because it is a crown for a king. So what would this lineage here be, claiming false blessing with the Tet. And the possession of these garments of skin. Well, in Yasher 7, it reads that Noah took them, the garments, and they were with him until he went out from the, from the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah his father, and he took them and he hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begat his firstborn, that is Cush, he gave him those garments in secret. And they were with Cush many days, and Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, the little baby of the family, the grandbaby of Ham, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up. And when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. And Nimrod became Dark Lord Nimrod, at least in his own mind, became strong when he put on those garments. Now, were these covering garments, would they possibly have been, I'm just putting this out there, would these have been same colorful garments or skins that might have been taken from an ancient snake or devil himself? Colorful garments and skins of the Nakosh the actual serpent, starting the first Dork empires of Earth, were those the skins that Nimrod was wearing? Now from the, the serpent's perspective, the, the cautious perspective, to go from being a Gordian cherub to being downcast to now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other animals, just another animal. God had made a crafty one to go from being a Gordian cherub to perhaps losing your hide, your skin, and for God to literally say, okay, I think I'm going to take that Gordian skin right off of you. If that's what we have in view, there's a lot of speculation there, but I, I lay it in your hands. But if that's what the situation were, that a once Gordian cherub has been lessened. And man broke the only one rule, just don't touch my, my tree. But seeing as how you do as thou willst, and the serpent, a once Gordian cherub, is the encourager as opposed to the cover, perhaps, here you go, why don't you take his skins 
You be your own covering cherub, Adam, since you can't even follow one rule. And that snake, well, it was just a, it was just a clever animal that I once made. Could you easily see how that creature would not only be angry at you, wish it could be you and desire to destroy you? Another way to phrase that would be this. Is anyone ever going to come and lay down their life to save the snake? You know the answer to that. And so does the serpent. But those garments, no matter how shiny or colorful that they were, I used to believe, actually very strongly, that those garments were something more noble, like possibly a, uh, a lion or maybe even a sheep or a, or a lamb. And they may well be. I wasn't there. But this is what I know about those garments. They were never a badge of honor. For Adam and Eve, or even for Noah, the garments were never what Nimrod thought they were. They weren't a badge of honor. They were a covering of shame. That's what they were, no matter what creature that they may have come from. And speaking of symbols in which they take the meaning and twist it, just like perhaps one who might say they're holy and blessed as a literal sun god on earth, when they're anything but blessed. Right here I have an image from Gilgamesh and Enkidu, or Gilgamesh and Tammuz where Gilgamesh is seen defeating, very famous portrayal. He's defeating the bull of heaven. Of course, in symbolism, the Aleph would be a representation of God himself. So through this lineage here, we're portraying later on walls that we are bigger than God. We are defeating the bull of heaven. In Egypt, they would sacrifice the Apis bulls it's for the goddess Hathor. Here's again a goddess. This is the goddess Hathor. She's got the, she's got the same symbol on her head, the birth canal or the womb with the sun god resting inside of it. This is at the temple of Hathor. Underneath we're birthing a whole string of serpents. But for Hathor, we'll be sacrificing the bull, the apis bull. Apis bull will lay down its life for Egypt. What are the Apis bulls? So they were sacrificing these in the first dynasty of Egypt. So look how many of these chambers. All right, but yeah, but these are these are tombs for cows. They were burying cows, holy cows. Holy cows is what these are. Holy cow. That's where you get the term holy cow from. Look at the size of these. They're enormous, they're granite. And this hallway is enormous. It goes this way and that a long ways. He's so you can actually see very clearly why God would be so upset when Moses came down from the, from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and they had a golden cow. This is actually one of the first gods of ancient Egypt that they're you now bowing to worship to an idol of. And the first of the Ten Commandments is no other gods before me. In fact, the first four are all about honoring God. yod He vov He, honoring God, first four. The last six, like the number of man is six, is actually all about honoring, honoring yourself and others. In fact, Jesus summarized the law by stating, if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your spirit, and your neighbor as yourself, you will have fulfilled all of the law of all of the prophets. The last six are do not lie, do not cheat, do not steal, do not murder, don't take your neighbor's wife, honor your father and mother. Which one of those? Because it's always these systems that want to take those and flip them upside down. Which one of those, beginning with honor the Lord God, don't bite the hand that feeds, but honor him, which one of those 
are rules that we should do away with. But Hathor, seen right here, birthing her whole array of serpents at the Temple of Hathor. Well, this is the Normer palette in my hand right here. It's quite literally one of the originating documents of all Egypt at the top up here. These characters look a lot like Tammuz, the goat, or the Baphomet, the Dumazid, don't they, up there? Our Pied Piper Pan. Well, that's actually on top. That's the that's the cow goddess that is the god hathor on both sides on the adorning the top of the document also these strange creatures almost look very prehistoric like a lot of stuff from the ancient world particularly before the flood and shortly after the flood but those are some weird looking creatures they have captive there like a lot of stuff on stones the god Hathor is who they had run back to when they made their, their golden cow out there by Mount Sinai. All of these systems, just like where we first began, and all of their circle calendars encapsulated by the serpents on top of our ancient sun gods from Egypt to the inception of ancient Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was, all come full circle, just like the Ouroboros, to the worship of the, the ancient Nikosh, the ancient serpent. That right there is a priest of the sun god Ra holding a staff, throwing it down to become one of the first gods worshipped on all earth from the rising pyramids with the eye on top of ancient Egypt coming right over here to where the Tower of Babel actually took its rise in ancient Eridu where you find the, the first gods of Egypt. In fact, you find literally hundreds of these little idols. This is quite literally the the origin of Babel, or what you would today call Babylon. These are little idols that they had. I've got him covered down here. It's clearly a male one. And do these heads on the screen like this one from Iran, do they look strikingly like these idols that I'm holding? This is the female. This is the male, look very amphibious and reptilian, don't they? And I, hundreds and hundreds of these, all over the place, out there at these sites. An archeological dig at Eridu, just after World War II, revealed about a thousand bodies that had been buried during the Ubaid period. That's the period that these come from. They come from around where that Tower of Babel was. Buried during the Ubaid period. Of 206 sets of remains the archaeologists exhumed, all of the crania had been deformed in one way or another. This one here is from Iran. This is what they were worshipping out there around the Tower of Babel. Right here, right there, where that tower would take its rise. And these strange heads or elongated heads that you find out there all around specifically Eridu, where that Tower of Babel was, are very, very similar to these, which are found around temple sites, just like the Tower of Babel. And I don't know what these are. I just, they're strange. And there's lots of them. And there's a lot of little technical differences between one of these and a natural human head, which I've covered on a lot of different videos. But you just look at it. And say to yourself, there's something strange about this fella. And not only this, and by the way, does this head here look similar to these heads here, of which hundreds were found out there by the Tower of Babel. Here's my Namu, or my Tiamat. Namu is the older name of Tiamat, the serpent goddess. The Mother Goddess, the Gaia Mother Goddess. Right here I have one that's trying to copy this one, is what's believed. What's commonly believed about these two skulls is that 
this one here was trying to copy this one here but the even larger discovery of what may be or is possibly true is that this one here appears to have been a, a, a God in a nutshell fan and it's mainly believed to be true because of the God in a nutshell hat that this one is uh, was recently discovered wearing it's a God in a nutshell fan it's got a truth is in the journey hat on which has got the little God in a nutshell logo on it right there giving all praise to yud he vav he Lord God of the universe on the hat that it's wearing ones that look like this we're trying to copy ones that look let me cover my mail one up like this that would be my opinion these are what the new sets of films look like guys here's what they they actually look like here's what a set of them would look like when you order them you can also get a, a full pack of, of three sets we have some package deals there so you could have one set for yourself and some for friends we also I honestly speaking guys I believe that these including these these valves that are back in there in the partner section and also here's the valve part one that's what that looks like and here in my hand is the valve part two I I, I truly believe this is probably some of the best work that we've we've ever done. Here's what the, the sets look like. You can immediately stream all of the films by coming right over here in the shop section of the God in a Nutshell website where it says partner streaming. That will let you into the partner section on the back of the screen back here. Here's what that looks like and as you scroll down all of these films including the new genesis series all of those films are there but a lot of our older films are in there as well that you can stream the partner section you can stream any of the films that you want for that's roughly the cost of a of a movie ticket and i thank all of you for supporting god in a nutshell around temple sites thought to be gods or royalty, around temples to the sun or the moon in South America, or temples like those to Quasicettle or any of the other variety of names of the winged serpent god of the air, lord of the air, are where these are found. And this one, the female of the two that I've got in my hand, there are hundreds and hundreds of these, and it's nursing a child. The mother goddess serpent could be could be described as the Babylonian Tiamat, is what she is right there. And if we go back just a little further in time to where the Tower of Babel actually took its rise in ancient Eridu, this serpent goddess right here would be called. Namu, what was it that they were worshiping? Right here at these, these sites, it was right here where that tower took its rise in Eridu, where these were, these were found. Literally hundreds of these little idols. Kind of a, this is what they were praying to, that they believed was just behind the scenes of their ancient temples. And surrounding these, you have many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of these. Now these are called, what these little guys are, these are called eye idols. They're little spookies, little wisps, almost look like E.T. that they believed were just behind the scenes of their reality. And above these little whispers and wisps, they believe there was a great lord, Tiamat, Namu, serpent, god, or goddess, if you like. The spirits inhabiting their Apkelu Jen pre-flood copy their conjures. So at the heart of the conjures, the king, Utu, the sun god, and his moon goddess are summonsing through their inner layer of conjures 
Namu, or Tiamat, if you like, and all of the little spookies and serpent gods and scorpions alike are communicating with the head king through the first god king, the sun god through their mediator, the Inky coming through his portal with his little dudes on the side. And the Inky, as seen right here on this little tablet guy, that thing there coming through those wavy lines, that's the, that's the Inky coming up from his dimensional portal. Right next to him is Utu, cutting his way from between some set of two mountains. So all of this occult stuff, the worship of the Nakosh, the serpent, which of course pops up from our pre-flood world, going from the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, back to the Assyrians. All of the other cultures stretching down into India and Asia, down into Africa, then on into the Americas, we have full records for all of this going through these lineages here and ultimately back to the very beginning where you had at the very top of the top the worship of the, the serpent goddess. All of it comes back to right here, this side of the flood, right here where in fact it was Gilgamesh who told us that he took a journey from here with his friend Inkadu, otherwise known as Tammuz. They took a journey up here directly to visit Utnapishtim, who he states, right on his document, on his stone, lived between the, the two peaks, just like Utu, the Shemesh, is pictured there. In fact, Gilgamesh tells us, right on tablet 10, he says, if possible, I will cross the sea. The only one who crosses the sea is the valiant Shemesh, except for him, that's Ham, Noah's rebellious son, who can cross. He's the only one that knows the way to the two peaks. Why didn't he tell anybody how to get up there? Because they would find out the truth about his empire. Gilgamesh says that he went north from Ur and Yurik, up the Tigris and Euphrates, arriving finally at the pleasant land with the vineyards between the two mountain peaks. Same place that old Utu, the Shemesh, came from. Occult history not only comes from these empires right here, their pyramids, their sun gods, their goat heads, and their serpents, but that all starts right here with this set right here of six names going from Utu down to Gilgamesh. Utu comes after Utnapishtim on the Sumerian king's list, and that Gilgamesh and Tammuz, by the way, all of these people lived at the same time, well, until they started dying off, but at the same time with each other, Gilgamesh, number six, Tammuz, number five, were both best friends. Gilgamesh, the best friend of Tammuz, he's born through the house of Lugalbanda. That's the second in command under Nimrod. Whereas Tammuz, born of the Inki or Inkadu, treated as a royal son, but claims to have a occult origin, possibly coming through this strange one, Canaan. But Tammuz, our flute player Pan, our pied Piper, the goat Inkadu, and Gilgamesh, the one who states on the Sumerian king's list, Gilgamesh, whose father was the unseen one. So we come into part six, we're gonna learn a little more about what they were doing out there. 
It's a lot of work, by the way, to coordinate these names on this list with the biblical text. Lugalbanda, number four, is actually Shord Lemaire of Alam. Above him, Nimrod or Enmerker, followed by his father Cush. And at the very top, we have Utu, the claimed sun god right there, who tells us that he originally came from, well, this is where his first Ebabar, or White House, was right here. But yet he tells us that he came from some set of two mountain peaks right up here in these mountains up here. Then Utu, or the Shemesh, tells us on the Atrahasis tablet, written in Akkadian, in my hand, and all of these here, every one of them, from Gilgamesh to Atrahasis to the Eridogenes, all of them, nearly all of them, are talking about Noah under a variety of different names, whether you call Noah Utnapishtim, whether you call him Zusudra or Zuostra, or whether you call him Atrahasis, which could mean extremely, extremely wise one, or one with very, very long life. He tells us that directly following the flood, he, Utu, the Shemesh, was, was there. In fact, he states on this document that Utnapishtim, or Atrahasis, on this stone, in the same location where Gilgamesh tells us that Noah was, well, that Noah came and bowed down to him. In other words, he's stating it's not just that he's claiming Noah bowed down to the sun god. He's claiming on this tablet and everyone would have known it. He's claiming that Noah came and bowed down to him following the flood is what he's claiming on this rock right here. Yeah, it's pretty insulting. But then Utu, or first sun god of earth, claims that he valiantly fought his way forth from between the two mountain peaks to forge the opening of the new world, the new empire coming from where Gilgamesh went back to to find his origins. Coming down, here's Utu fighting his way out from between two mountain peaks, just like right here on this little rock. That's Utu, and this behind me is a close-up of this same little seal, the Ara seal right here. What you have on this, so this is Utu when he's valiantly coming forth. And here he comes forth. This is simply another cylinder seal, just like this one. His head fraudulency himself emerging forth to forge the first empires, empires leading all the way to this day of all earth, fending off the elements all on his own with his little knife in his hand. These represent two mountains that he's coming forth out of same place that Gilgamesh went when he was trying to visit Utnapishtim. These are two mountains, that's Utu. Right over here, he's being guided by the Inki who's always displayed coming out of his dimensional portal. In fact, the Inki comes from this lineage of the great serpent goddess right here, the Babylonian Tiamat, which we find on the text of the Enuma Elish, in my hand right here, where we also find the Titans, the sons of Anu, the Anunnaki. In fact, Inki is a product of these lords of the air right here, Anu and Shar, and the lord of the air through whom you get Inki, behind which is the empire of the great goddess Tiamat the serpent goddess of the Abzu, the abyss, which it's the one and the same abyss where Inki is coming forth out of. Notice Inki has his dark bird 
his raven, his falcon, his crow, guiding the way, just like on all the later imagery of birds, his dark bird. Inky is wearing, on top of his head, not just the crowned horned helmet. Notice they're all wearing those crowned horned helmets. This is where you get the imagery today of the modern day witch's hat atop Inky's head. Inky is guiding Utu to the birth of the new world described on these Sumerian documents where the Tower of Babel would rise. To the side of Inki over here, we have the formulation of the first political systems of Babel, later Babylon. This is the two-faced priest. He says one thing, does another. Symbolism is very straightforward. And right here, we have our little mistress in Nana. And there she is right there in Nana, next to Utu, coming out from between the two mountains, knife in hand, and the Inky over here. You have been watching part five, Signs, by the God in a Nutshell Project. On part six, just like the six arrows, Coming out of Inanna's back. In Babylon, they love those sixes. But in part six, the Vov, we're going to talk about the origin of Little Miss. Damaged and broken goods in Nana. There's a story behind this little lady right here and her, and her wings. But our perpetual virgin, she is coming up and following Utu right here. She left also out of those mountains where Utnapishtim Noah was. I'd like to thank all of you for, for watching and also for supporting God in a Nutshell in any possible way that you have over the years, which includes the... I want to thank you because these videos take quite a bit more work than probably most people realize, and I'm very happy, I'm always excited to put them together. These are what the books look like that go with the films that you're watching. Here's the Nimrod one. They're all, all of these are fully illustrated. Every page of them. And they, they do, they look fantastic on any coffee table. And if you thought this one was good, well, this one was just sort of the tip of the uh, the iceberg. And part six, the the valve right there, is it's available to watch over on godinanutshell.com. And it would of course only be appropriate in a part six. They have both the rise and fall of our dark lord Nimrod. Now let me ask you this, speaking of eyes on top of towers, do these little eye idols that I'm holding in my hand, now, do these look like owls to you? Or do they look like sort of what people describe in these otherworldly experiences? Erect the great abode for me. Make the great abode the abode of the gods. Make me famous. What did they want at the Tower of Babel? Make our name great in all of the earth. This is literally on these ancient stones. Now it's in their legends, if I'm understanding them right, that the habitation of the righteous gods is up in the mountains where there were originally the three sons, the families of the three sons, the place that Utu was expelled from. Now, you know, as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. If you had a third of the angels fall, isn't it just fantastic signs and symbols that it would be one, one of the, of the, the three being chased away, being expelled like one third, one of the three sons being expelled and being forced, as they say in the occult, to forge his own empire. Are these stories sounding familiar? But he was kicked out, 
the pleasant land between the two mountains. The same area where Nimrod, Utu's grandson, on the Sumerian king's list, would be writing these stones, called in Merkur and the Lord of the Rata, from right down in here, all the way up here to the, the Lord of Arata, who lives between the peaks of the Ararat Mountains. Again, all of these stones focus at their heart on one person. And that would be Noah right here, who goes by literally hundreds of names, covering that flood story. And then you have Utu, the Shemesh, Ham, the sun god. Kush, or Meshki and Gesher, would come next. Founder of the city of Kish or Kush. And then in Merkur, or Nimrod, writing these little stones, like the one I have in my hand. Up to the Lord of Arata in the mountains, where Utu was initially kicked out of, but lied about it. And there's a story behind that. And I'm going to tell you as we move into the... I'm going to tell you. For now, it's sufficient to know. He's writing these rocks, Nimrod was, to someone, someone important, someone very important, only person he thought about. These were the longest letters and documents he ever wrote up to someone seeking approval, being arrogant, but also seeking approval, like arrogant men do, to someone that didn't give him great replies. Told him basically, who are you? You're nobody in response to all his many messages. Someone up there in those mountains in the pleasant land where Gilgamesh had gone and where Utu had come from. The abode of the gods, make me famous, make me prosper, make the Abzu, that means abyss, the underworld domain of the god Inki up here that comes through his little portal, the portal of the Tiamat, the serpent. Make it grow for me like a holy mountain to make me, Nimrod, famous in all the earth. That was written by Nimrod. I'm Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell. In part six, we're gonna be watching the, the rise and fall, amongst other things, a lot of other things, but the rise and fall of Dark Lord Nimrod. God bless every last one of you and your families on the other side of the screen. Are you still are you still here? The uh, the, the movie's over. <laughs> There's some clips from the Vav. One clip from the Vav, part one and two. These are the words of Lucifer and his many sun gods. Yeah, look how quick God deals with this, just like this. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee 